Well, good morning. Welcome to worship. Welcome to snow. It's kind of nice to see things looking a little more Christmassy out there. Let's uh, take a look at some of these announcements real quick. First of all, uh, we could use some help after the service today. Uh, some strong arms to get the Christmas decorations and ladder out of the shed out there so that the ladies can decorate this week. Uh, should, shouldn't take very long. Uh, just a few things to bring in. Uh, also, a reminder too that women's ministries have adopted a family for Christmas from the Valley Women's and Children's Shelter. And uh, so there is a wish, wish list provided uh, of things that they need and could use. And so if you would like to contribute to that, uh, you can catch Debbie in the kitchen after the service today to find out what is still needed there. On your announcements page inside your bulletin there, you'll see the uh, schedule for the Christmas program practices. Next one will be this Wednesday, uh, the 4th at 7 o'clock. And just a reminder, make sure you uh, communicate with Greg if, uh, if your kid's involved but can't be there. That certainly helps him out with planning. Also, the Women's Annual Christmas Party is happening this Thursday at 6.30. Uh, and you're encouraged to bring an appetizer or a dessert to share. And there's also going to be a gift exchange going on uh, that night with a $15 limit on those gifts. And all women are invited to that. And I hope we, hope we can make it. It's always a great time. And uh, if you need a ride, if you're concerned about the weather or the fact that it's at night, go ahead and get in contact with Alice Davis. Her number's in the bulletin there. And she can make sure uh, that you get a ride to it. Christmas caroling will be happening again this year. It's going to be on December 8th, 5.30. That's, going to, that's next Sunday. We'll meet here at the church at 5.30, split into groups, and go uh, visit some of the, the shut-ins and elderly around the congregation that, uh, uh, so that we can go and Christmas carol to them, cheer them up, all that kind of stuff. And then we also gather back here afterwards for a time of, of refreshments, snacks, all that kind of stuff. And you're encouraged to bring a, uh, a plate of goodies or snacks to share for that too. And just a reminder that you do not have to be a good singer to go Christmas caroling. You just have to be able to make noise. It's all, all noise is appreciated. <laughs> Sunday School Christmas programs happening December 15th at 6.30. And I uh, really hope you can make it out for that. The kids always do a wonderful job every year uh, presenting the, the Christmas message and the, and the message of Christ uh, to us every year. So that's the 15th at 6.30. Reminder, too, that we have that group of serving, serving sisters available to help out with uh, chores and errands and that kind of stuff, uh, you can contact Alice Davis, and her inf contact information is, again, in the bulletin there, if uh, you can use their help. And a reminder, too, that we do have a prayer chain that goes over both phone and email. Um, you can, uh, if, you, if you have a request for it, email or phone Pat Schutte, and she'll make sure that that request is spread. Likewise, if you're not on the, on the prayer chain and would like to be, you can uh, contact her about that as well. Then also, we are forming together a Christmas choir uh, to do some special music this year. And so right after the service today, if you'd like to be involved with that, we'll be meeting right over here by the, by the piano immediately following the service. All right, let's see. What, oh, also on the back of your announcements insert, you'll see a uh, letter, a nice letter we just received from the Hoshes. Uh, the Hoshes are a missionary family to Taiwan that we've been supporting all throughout the year. And so I encourage you to look at that and, and read what they're up to. Aside from those announcements, any others need to get out there this morning? All right. Good, 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 good. Well, in that case, I'll encourage you to turn with me to our call to worship. I can get my te technology to agree with me. Our call to worship today comes from Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. 
a wonderful prophecy regarding Christ and what he is going to do for all the earth. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. Let's read that out loud together. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Amen. Let us now sing our praises to God with our praise choruses this morning. speak to us come and renew us come and live through us Emmanuel grace to implore us ever before us come and restore us Emmanuel come Emmanuel Fullness 
sense of God despised and rejected, crushed for the sins of the world. Fullness of hope in Christ we had longed for, promise of God in Jesus. Through his obedience we are forgiven, opening the floodgates of hell. All our hopes and dreams we bring, gladly as an offering. Fullness of life and joy unspeakable, God's gift in love to the world. By faith we see the hand of God in the light of Christian's grand design. In the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. By faith our fathers roamed the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts. Of a holy city built by God's own hand, a place where peace and justice reign. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the prophets saw a day when the longed for Messiah would appear with the power to break the chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the grave. By faith the church was called to go In the power of the Spirit to the lost To deliver captives and to preach good news In every corner of the earth We will stand as children of the promise We will fix our eyes on Him, our soul's reward Till the grace is finished and the work is done We'll walk by faith and not by sight By faith this mountain shall be moved And the power of the gospel shall prevail For we know in Christ all things are possible for all who call upon his name. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. Walk by faith and not by sight. And with that, I'll encourage you to turn with me now to our first hymn this morning. Hymn number 41 in those hymnals. Hymn number 41 is Holy, Holy, Holy. I'll invite you to please rise as we sing this hymn together. Yeah. 
seated. And as we turn back to scripture, I get to invite up Dave Bradburn, who's going to be sharing a reading with us this morning. Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence, or superior wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ 
and him crucified, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest in men's wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, at his as it is written, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it in but God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. But we, have but we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Thank you so much. What a, what a great reminder that is, is, is that worldly, worldly wisdom can be wonderful. It can explain to us mysteries of, of how natural processes work and everything like that, but it does nothing in terms of spiritual wisdom. That must come from the Spirit. And uh, to be reminded that to have faith in Christ, just that faith itself is a miracle, is a gift from God, is the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in each and every one of us. And uh, a wonderful reminder, too, that those who are without aren't to be considered the enemy, aren't to be uh, hated, but are to be looked at with compassion, for they are continuing to reject that spirit and, and look at them in the hope that they eventually will, too, receive that wisdom that can only come from the Spirit. We get to go out this time to, uh, to prayer, where we get to pray together as a church family and pray alongside each other. And so before we do go to prayer this morning, I'll, I'll ask if there are any special prayer requests that we can be sharing today. Jeff. Okay. Thank you. We'll be praying for Art England's son, Jeff, who had a stroke on Thanksgiving. Thank you. That was that was cancer, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. We'll continue to pray for Heather and her battles with cancer. Oh yeah. 
Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Definitely. We'll, we'll keep Dave's friend in our prayers and pray that, that that God's word continues to come to him, that the Holy Spirit comes with that word and brings about faith. Oh. Sure thing. Thank you. We'll be praying for your sister and, and her broken foot, which seems like that's been an ongoing thing. So be praying for that recovery too. Thank you. Absolutely. Still a lot of traveling going on. So I'll be pray praying for, uh, for safety there. Thank you. Well, if there are no others, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you are glorious, you are merciful, you are gracious. You've looked upon us and seen us in our sin. And though you do, it is your nature to judge and condemn for sin, you looked on us with compassion going so far as to send your son into this world to come and live the life we could never live, dying the death that we deserve, taking on our sin and handing over his righteousness. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful gift that we get to focus on again as we approach Christmas. Lord, we pray that as we go through this season, as busy as it is, as stressful as it can be, that you would work in us to turn us constantly towards that baby. Jesus Christ, our Lord, come into this world frail, weak, and yet powerful enough to save us all. Lord, we bring these prayers to you and we, we thank you so much for, for inviting us to bring all things to you in prayer. And so we want to pray for Jeff this morning as he recovers from the stroke. We pray that his recovery would be full and complete, that it would not have left any lasting damage. We pray for Heather and her battles with cancer. We pray that you would give her comfort during this time, give her peace and uh, be with all of those who know her and love her and desire to care for her. Lord, we pray for uh, Dave's friend, his co-worker, uh, without faith, with great worldly wisdom, but yet lacking the work of your Holy Spirit in him. Lord, we pray that you would continue to provide ample opportunities for your word to come to him and that uh, you would break down his resistance and add him to your family. Lord, we pray for Tina's sister and, and these ongoing foot problems she has. We pray for this, this recent break in that foot. Pray that you would heal that up and uh, that while that's all going on, you would uh, provide the, the doctors with wisdom as to how to treat that and how to prevent this from happening again. Lord, we pray for all those who are traveling during this holiday season. We pray that uh, you would give safety on the roads, that you would give uh, just wonderful time with friends and family as well. Lord, we pray for uh, 
we continue to pray for the friends and family of Lydia as uh, the morning is ongoing. We pray that you would give comfort and peace there, give your sympathy, and most of all, that you would continue to uh, speak your word of saving power that, uh, that was evident in her faith. Lord, we pray for Larry Seibold and, and the, uh, the healing that he needs. We pray for the many ailments that he uh, is struggling with. Pray that you would give him strength. Lord, we pray that uh, you would give all of his family strength too as they seek to care for and minister to him. Lord, we pray for Larry Stoltenberg and, and his, the healing that he needs. Pray for strength in the, in the procedures and treatments that he'll be going through. We pray for Harvey, too, in the weaknesses he has, especially in that leg of his. We pray for healing there. And Lord, we pray for, for Candy. Pray for the healing she needs in her leg and her back. And uh, we thank you that, that you have already worked uh, healing into her. Lord, we pray for Bill and his uh, next round of cancer treatments. We pray that those treatments would do exactly what they inter- are intended to do and that through those you would bring healing to him. And Lord, we do pray for this church. We pray that we would delight in each other's company, that you would uh, cause in us a desire to continue to meet together and uh, that we would see ourselves as you see us, missionaries in this world, equipped and ready to bring your gospel out to a world that needs to hear it. Lord, we pray for conviction and strength and determination to carry out that mission. Lord, again, we thank you for this opportunity to pray. We thank you for the promise that you are hearing these prayers and that you are answering each and every one of them according to your perfect wisdom. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's at this time that uh, we're going to turn to lighting the Advent candles. Advent is a wonderful season. And as I grab myself a lighter back here. Um, What is Advent? Well, Advent, look at that. Somebody was already way ahead of me. I knew knew that would happen. Advent is a time of waiting. It's a, it's a time of anticipation. It's a time when we get to, as a church, um, remember back to that time when Israel was desperately waiting for their Messiah, their Savior, as well as the fact that the whole world was groaning in anticipation of a Savior, groaning in its sin. Even as we look forward and now are groaning in anticipation for his return when he will make all things new again. And uh, so it is traditional to have an Advent wreath this time of year. And this this Advent wreath is is really packed with with meaning. And I like to, to talk about that every year. The circle of the wreath itself is an image uh, of God who has no beginning and no end, who always was, is, and ever will be. The green of the wreath reminds us of the hope of new life. Green is a, is a color of life and, and talks about the new life we have in Christ. The flames of the candles symbolize that Jesus is the light that was born into darkness, the darkness of our world. And as more candles are lit, the darkness and the hopelessness of sin begins to recede. The four outer candles represent the period of waiting during the Sundays of Advent, four Sundays in Advent, as well as the four centuries of waiting between Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament, and the birth of Christ. And each candle will remind us to watch, to prepare, to rejoice, to behold, and finally point us towards Jesus, Emmanuel. God with us. And so each Sunday we'll be reading a verse from the Bible that celebrates the birth of Jesus as it was anticipated by God's people who are waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And uh, after that verse, we will light the candle for the day. Then we'll be reading a verse from the Bible that helps us to look forward to when Christ 
returns again to take his church to be with him in heaven. And so today on the first Sunday of Advent, we will be lighting the first candle. That reminds us to watch, to be on the lookout for Christ's coming. The people of Israel looked forward to the coming of the Messiah for, for many generations. And one, uh, one such man that we see in Scripture was Simeon. From Luke 2, verses 25 to 32, we read, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Just as Simeon and, and the Israelites watched for the coming of their Messiah, so too do we watch for the coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ our Lord. As Matthew twenty four forty two reminds us, therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. And with that, I invite you to turn with me to our next hymn. Hymn number 170. And because we're in Advent, we get to go to the Christmas carols. Hymn number 170 is Joy to the World. Please rise as we sing together. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow. Nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow. Far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as the, as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders, wonders of his love. Amen. You may be seated. 
As we go to offering this morning, I wanted to share that I was reminded it has been our tradition in years past during our Thanksgiving service to take up an offering that goes towards famine relief in Chad, Africa. Um, Chad is one of those those nations that is very prone to to famine, and uh, this year is no different. And so I just wanted to go ahead and get that out there. If you missed out on, on giving to Chad Famine Relief, you are certainly welcome to still give. Uh, you can designate your checks as such or use the envelopes for cash. And uh, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to bless that country, which we are so invested in, in spreading the gospel among those people as well. So let's now turn our attention to the giving of our offerings. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, for your provisions. We see that you have provided us so much. And uh, we, we thank you for this opportunity to give back. We pray, Lord, that these gifts would be acceptable in your sight and that you would cause them to be used exactly as you would have them used. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. we get to turn back to scripture now this time with a reading from Romans I'll be reading from Romans chapter 13 verses 8 through 14 and I'll give you a moment if you want to follow along in your own Bibles there Romans chapter 13 verses 8 through 14 wonderful verse about what it means to uh, love your neighbor as well as the the kind of life we get to live as as children of God and followers of Christ in this world Romans chapter 13 starting with verse 8 reading in Jesus name oh nothing to anyone except to love one another For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Do this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone, and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. We know, uh, because Scripture makes it clear to us, that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. And there is no adding to that salvation or taking away from it based on the works that we do. But yet... Because we are children of God and because we have his Holy Spirit in us, it is now our desire to walk according to the Spirit, to walk according to the commandments of God, to love our neighbor uh, just as much as we love ourselves. And so it is good for Scripture to encourage us us to that. Because, you know, we all still have that sinful nature that likes to do its own thing. That is selfish but we don't have to be that. We get to uh, be the people of God, loving our neighbor, just as God loves them. Let's turn now to our next hymn this morning. Hymn number 171 this time. Hymn number 171 is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And again, please rise as you are able as we sing this hymn together. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou rod of Jesse, free, thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save, and give them victory o'er the grave. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. O drive away the shades of night, and pierce the clouds and bring us light. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come thou days of David, come and open wide our heavenly home, where all thy saints with thee shall come. Come, Emmanuel, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall 
welcome to thee, O Israel. Please remain standing as we turn back to Scripture, this time with our reading that I made a last-minute change that didn't make it into the bulletin, so I don't want to throw you all off too much, but we are going to be actually looking at Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Much of this year will be spent in the Gospel of Matthew, um, but Mark chapter 1 is a wonderful place to kick off the Advent season where we see... John the Baptist uh, preparing the hearts of the people around him to receive the Messiah who has now come. And uh, John is a, is a wonderful person to look at uh, because he acts as this bridge between the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament um, speaking of Christ. And so we'll be looking at Mark chapter 1 verses 1 through 8. reading in Jesus' name. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit." This ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Every time we come around this time of year, uh, John the Baptist inevitably is going to show up in our scripture readings uh, because he's the one who is announcing that that time of waiting that I talked about concerning Advent is now over. Israel's wait for their Messiah is done. And, and so I always think about John the Baptist and, and, and think he kind of got a bum rap with that name. He really ought to be John the prophet because that's exactly what he is. I mean, yeah, he did do baptizing, but first and formal, for, foremost, John is a prophet and so it is a really good thing that now as, as we kick off Advent, which is that time when we focus on the anxious waiting for the Messiah, that we look at that prophetic ministry of John. And Mark especially places an emphasis on John as a prophet. He describes what John's clothes were like, for example. He was wearing camel's hair clothing and, and a simple leather belt. That to the people of Israel was an immediately recognizable indication that John was a prophet. In fact, it wasn't com uncommon for, for false prophets to dress exactly that way in order to try and gain credibility for the word that they're speaking. And along with John's very simple clothing, he also lived what you'd call an ascetic life. He's eating locusts and wild honey living outdoors. Um, not the kind of choice meats that you'd reserve for kings and, and priests, right? Right there, that's another mark of a prophet. And although Mark starts by saying that this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's to say that this is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, Mark immediately goes on to identify John with the prophecies God had been making about the pro promised Messiah from, from long ago. Though this is the beginning of the gospel, the coming of Jesus is a continuation of the great plan God had laid out for the salvation of the world. And John has come to once again prophesy God's word to the people. 
proclaiming that God is about to make good on the promises he had made throughout history. And so because John is so immediately recognizable as a prophet, people are, are flocking out to see him. All the people in the, in the great city of Jerusalem, it says here, as well as from the whole land of Judea uh, surrounding Jerusalem, are coming out to see John and hear his message. So why all the hubbub? Right? Well, for the Jewish people, God had been silent for a long time. The last true prophet was, as I mentioned earlier, Malachi. And he died over 400 years be before Jesus arrived on the scene. That's a long time to wait for God to speak. Over 400 years had passed since God last spoke to Israel. Long time to wait. And as you can imagine, the people were just climbing over each other to hear what John had to say. And John's message couldn't have been more, more awesome for the folks that, that came to hear him. He's repeating the words of Isaiah, the, the one that Isaiah spoke about when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. It's the one that David wrote about in Psalm 110 when he sang, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a fo footstool for your feet. That one prophesied so long ago is on his way right now. That's the message of John. The promised Messiah would bring about the kingdom of heaven. The promised Messiah who Isaiah said would be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. He's coming and has already come to fulfill the promise that God would redeem all creation to himself. But like any good king, that Messiah needs a smooth road. Needs a smooth road to travel on. And the rugged mountains and the desert wastelands that exist in the heart of sinful man, those need to be leveled out. And so John proclaims that the way needs to be cleared. Yeah, I'm going with John the prophet. And so now that John has identified himself as continuing the word of God in his prophetic ministry, he goes on to announce the next word that God has given him. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Wow. Now that's something new. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's a mouthful. And we need to break that into bite-sized pieces. But this is new for the people of Israel. Up until now, how would the Jews receive forgiveness of sins? Well, certainly through faith in a God that had promised that the Messiah would come. In believing that God would, sometime in the future, send the Messiah to take away sins, the Jews were placing their faith in that future work. And that faith saved them. But in the meantime, they were also given the whole sacrificial system of the temple in order to atone for, them, for their sins. The blood of sheep and bulls and, and all those kinds of things would be offered for specific sins, as well as burn offerings and all kinds of other types of sacrifices. But never before was a baptism offered for the forgiveness of sins. See, now that the Messiah is on his way, the old things are already, are already passing away. They're already being replaced with a whole different type of atoning sacrifice for sins. Of course, that different type being Jesus Christ himself. And yet, the baptism that John is doing isn't quite up to snuff, is it? John has to admit that Someone's, someone coming to him will, some, someone coming soon rather, will make this baptism complete. Not simply baptizing with water, but also baptizing with the Holy Spirit. John, even though he's a prophet, and even though the prophet is always the top dog in Jewish hierarchy, 
He has to admit that even he isn't worthy to do the most menial task of removing this man's sandals. And although he's been given the task of administering this sacramental washing called baptism, he has no ability to baptize with the Holy Spirit. That ability belongs to the Messiah and the Messiah alone. So when Jesus Christ's work on the cross is done and after he's been raised to the right hand of God, then this baptism that they are all receiving will be complete. And all baptisms from then on will carry with them the dual promise of the forgiveness of sins and the giving of the Holy Spirit. One baptism in which God's word of promise is joined with the water to bring about a very real forgiveness of sins and the very real giving of the Holy Spirit. Wow. No wonder people were were pouring out to the Jordan to hear John's message, right? He was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I said we're going to break down a little bit, so let's, let's do that. Let's start with the two easier parts. First, you've got the forgiveness of sins. That's not hard to understand, but it is almost unbelievable. Forgiveness of sins. Scripture makes it clear that our hearts are hopelessly corrupt and sinful. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? In Isaiah, in Isaiah 1, 5 through 6, we read that, Where will you be stricken again as you continue in your rebellion? The whole head is sick, and the whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head there is nothing sound in it, only bruises, welts, and raw wounds, not pressed out or bandaged, nor softened with oil. The whole of our being is corrupted, deceitful, broken, wasting away because of this sin problem that is born into us. And just in case you might be tempted to say that sin is somehow a learned thing, that innocent babies cannot possibly be sinful, we have King David writing, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. We have a sin problem that has completely corrupted us. And we need nothing short of God's work to provide the forgiveness we need in order to be able to stand before him. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins? Yeah, sign me up. And the second part that's easy to understand about this is that word baptism. Baptism simply means washing. When the word appears in scripture or in other Jewish writings of the time, it refers to a ceremonial washing that refers to cleansing someone of a, of a spiritual impurity, like when you've uh, touched a dead body or this, that, or the other thing. A, a washing that cleanses you of spiritual impurity. Now that's done in a number of different ways. It might be the washing of hands. It might be the sprinkling water on someone, washing their forehead, or even immersing them in water. And just so that we're not tempted to go beyond what Scripture tells us, uh, the mode of baptism, the, the, the way that we perform baptism, isn't important. It's not spelled out for us, whether we baptize by sprinkling, wiping, dunking, whatever. The baptism does exactly what it's promised to do for the forgiveness of sins. Because when it's done, it is done in the power of God's word of promise baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins we've got a handle on baptism and we've got the forgiveness of sins ironed out and that leaves us with the part I wanted to spend the most time on repentance what is repentance anyway right most of us here use that word in conversation with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and and we use it in our prayers and it's an incredibly important word and therefore again it's always very important that we have a good handle on exactly what repentance really means great damage has been done to that word repentance 
by certain sects of the Christian church throughout history. And so in order to understand it, we've got to let the Bible do what the Bible does best, interpret itself. So that word repentance is how the Greek word uh, metanoio, maybe you've heard that referred to before, it's how metanoio gets translated into English. And metanoio carries with it the idea of turning around. So you picture yourself, I know I've done this, vi this visual before, you picture yourself heading one direction, and you turn 180 degrees around, and you're going the other direction. That's repentance. But this idea of turning around is where we can start going very wrong when it comes to properly understanding repentance. I grew up in a, in a Baptist church, and a lot of you know that. And, and I want to be very clear that I do not have a problem with the Baptist church. Uh, however, in the particular church I was raised in, repentance was taught in such a way that repentance meant turning away from sin and turning towards obedience to the law. Turning away from sin and turning towards obedience to the law. Now that doesn't sound so bad, right? You turn away from rebelling against God and turn towards obeying his commandments. And that, unfortunately, is, is actually a very common way of understanding the word repentance. But there's a fatal flaw in that idea. And when I say fatal, I mean eternally fatal. Because it can very well mean losing out on salvation and everlasting life. Let me explain why. Repentance is turning, right? I'm heading one direction, okay? I'm heading down a road where I don't trust God, I don't obey his commandments, and I am hopelessly corrupt and sinful, just like those passages I just read talked about. I am walking down a road that leads only to death and hell. That's the default for all of us everlasting death because of our sinfulness. And when God's word reveals this to me, that I really do fall under his judgment for my sins, I need to turn. I need to turn away from my sinfulness, don't I? But what happens when I turn from my sinfulness and turn towards obedience to the law? Nothing has changed. I'm no better off going that direction than I was before. Because I'm not going to be able to obey that law. I'm not going to be able to obey that law any more than I already was. In fact, I'm going to be worse off because God's commandments are only going to continue to show me just how much I sin. All I'm doing is turning from the law that condemns me toward the law that condemns me. Instead, we vow to look at how Scripture views repentance. If you have the chance, I want you to turn with me to, to Romans 8. Romans 8, I'm going to look at verses 2 to 4. And I'll give you a moment to find that. And this is an important section to look at because it tells us why turning from sin towards obedience doesn't work. Romans 8, 2-4. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see, the weakness of our flesh makes it impossible for the law to create righteousness in us. In other words, our sinful nature makes it impossible for us to be obedient to God's commands. You simply cannot turn away from sin and turn towards obedience to God's commands, expecting to find salvation there. 
the law is powerless to save you. And you see this thought echoed in other places like Galatians 3. If a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. But, big but there, but the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Philippians 3, 5 to 7 is another one where Paul is talking about how, how awesomely he himself has kept the law, circumcised on the eighth day, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. All of those things that Paul could brag about are loss because Paul knows that he cannot turn to God's commandments in order to be able to stand before God. God's law cannot fix our sin problem. So where exactly do we turn? When we see ourselves heading down the road of sin and death and we know that we cannot turn towards obedience to the law, where do we turn? Well, there's only one place you can turn to, and that's the cross. The cross on which Jesus died is the only place you can turn to when you repent. When the high mountains of self-righteousness exist in your heart, when the barren wilderness of good deeds exists in your heart, when the broken road of good intentions and failures exist in your heart, all preventing the passage of the coming king from entering in, you turn instead toward the cross on which Jesus died. That's what repentance is, and it can be no other. Repentance is that you allow God's word of law to convict you of your sinfulness. You allow its pronouncement of judgment upon your sin to break down the mountains and clear the wilderness in your heart and then turn. Turn and allow the forgiveness and cleansing that was bought for you on the cross. Allow it to fill your heart and provide you with the perfect righteousness you could never achieve on your own. I know that repentance sounds like a bad word. It's not a, a feel-good word. But I want you to know that is a blessed word. When you let God's word speak to you, when you let him reveal to you the deceitful heart that you in your own power cannot understand, he will break down those impassable mountains of self-righteousness. He will... Lift up those barren wastelands of good works, all in preparation for the coming king who will impart to you his own righteousness, his own righteousness to have as your own. A righteousness that cannot be corrupted despite the failings of your flesh. And you will receive the promise of the kingdom of heaven Repentance is a blessed word, and it is one of the true meanings of Christmas. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that along with Christ comes repentance. We thank you that you show us our, our sins, show us the demands of the law, so that we would see just how short we had fallen from it. And Lord, we just, we thank you that you don't turn us towards a bondage again to that law, but rather you turn us to, to freedom in the spirit. Freedom in the knowledge that Christ's righteousness comes to us and becomes ours by faith. Lord, we pray that we would live out that life in the spirit through obedience to that law, knowing and trusting that our ability to do so has no bearing on the salvation that has already been won. Our God, thank you for repentance. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our last hymn for today is hymn number 208. 208 is All Glory, Laud, and Honor. And I'll invite you to uh, go ahead and please rise one last time as we sing this hymn together. All glory, Lord, and honor to the Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet oaths and us ring. Thou art the King of Israel, thou David's royal son who in the Lord's name comest, the King and Blessed One. The company of angels are praising Thee on high, and mortal man and all things created make reply. The people of the Hebrews with palms before thee went. Our praise and prayer and anthems before thee we present. To thee before thy passion they sang their hymns of praise. To thee now I exalted our melody re raise. Thou didst accept their praises, accept the praise we bring, who in all good delightest, thou good and gracious King. Please receive this benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings.